Hi guys, it's ASBYT and these are the brand new latest 2020 MacBooks from Apple, the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro 13. Both contain Apple's own in-house M1 chip moving away from Intel and in the short time that I've been using both of them, I've noticed some pretty shocking results with the new internals. As many will be unsure about which to get, as on paper to most people they look very similar, I will be comparing the two, and I will also be throwing the MacBook Pro Intel version into the mix as well for some comparisons such as video editing etc as it's also still on sale on the Apple website. For reference and full transparency in this specific style of comparison, I will be using my MacBook Pro 16 inch 2019 pretty much fully spec'd out model. You will find similar spec models for the 13 inch as well, so it'll just give you a rough idea. So if you are unsure about whether the very latest bleeding edge M1 chip versions of the new MacBooks are really worth the upgrade, uh, then stay tuned, hopefully this will help you. And spoiler alert, some things that are different due to that M1 chip really surprised me. And it's not all plain sailing for Apple's new big boy or girl. And thanks to Zen for sponsoring today's video. So firstly, what are the actual physical or design differences between the all new 2020 MacBook Air, the all new 13 inch MacBook Pro and the last gen 13 inch MacBook Pro with the Intel chip? And the answer is brutally, not a lot. In fact, nothing. So the same 3.5mm headphone jack on each and two USB Type-C ports on each, although the new Macs do have support for the all-new USB 4 standard, uh, which is, helps with faster data transfer, etc. Am I getting used to Type-C everything on a MacBook? Regrettably, even though I would still prefer to have an SD card slot for obvious reasons, uh, yes. Do I think that two ports on a MacBook Air is acceptable? Yes. Do I think there should be more than two ports on a MacBook Pro? Yes. I, I, I don't know how you can call a MacBook Pro a Pro model with just two ports, but dongle life continues, I guess. Now, even though all MacBooks look pretty much the same now, as the lines have really been blurred between the ranges, just like on the new iPhones, the Air is still the lightest, as you would expect, at 1.29 kilograms. Although the two Pros, old and new, aren't far behind at just 1.4 kilograms. So all three are certainly portable. All these MacBooks come with the new redesigned keyboard after heavy criticism of the butterfly keys that were introduced in 2015, and all are available in silver and space grey, but you can also get the Air in gold if that floats your boat. All three models have Touch ID, have pretty much the same 13 inch Retina IPS display with True Tone, although the Pros are slightly brighter at 500 nits max to the 400 on the Air. And the only real difference is the lack of touch bar on the Air. You will either probably like this quite a lot and use it a fair amount, or like me, don't really use it that much and aren't really bothered whether it's there or not. So if you're buying a brand new MacBook for work, social, for online video calls, for example, like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, then I would imagine video quality, microphone and speaker are fairly important. And on this, I could sit here and say the video quality is amazing and the microphone systems are as good as professional mics external that you plug in, but I'd be lying. That's not to say they're terrible, as you'll see in a few examples in a second, and they actually differ amongst the three, um, but they all suffer from the same one biggest problem, uh, and that is the fact that the webcam is still in 2020, believe it or not, 720p. Which, when you think the iPhones for the last few years have come with 4K capabilities on their video, uh, it just seems a, a bit bizarre, again, especially on a pro model. But importantly, there are actually subtle differences between the three when it comes to the actual image quality. So all have max 720p as stated, but importantly, because of the M1 chip that's new inside the new MacBooks, and we'll get more to the M1 chip in a second because it is a pretty huge talking point, the actual image quality is better on the new MacBooks due to the way the image is processed. It enhances the picture and in certain lighting, it's pretty striking the difference. They are still all 720p though, and definitely in my humble opinion, in 2020, they should be at least full HD. In terms of the microphones, the Intel MacBook Pros have a three mic array, as does the MacBook Air, but the new M1 MacBook Pro has a studio quality three mic array. 
will of course be the judge of that. And let me know what you think of the image and audio quality in these examples. Right, so this is the first test. This is the MacBook Pro 16 inch model that we've got here, the Intel version. And I want you to let me know what you think of the image quality coming out of that 720p camera and the audio coming from that three mic array in here as well. I have made it a little bit tricky with the lighting, etc. Lots of, you know, bright exposure points. So let's have a look at how good that dynamic range is. For example, I'm not going to hold my hopes too high, uh, but now we're going to switch to the MacBook Pro no, we're going to go to the MacBook Air next, the M1 version, to see how that changes things. And then we're going to go to the MacBook Pro 13-inch M1 chip. Now the MacBook Air with the M1 chip inside. And straight away, I can see that there is a difference with the image quality. Um, it definitely seems sharper due to that image processing, even though it is only still a 720p camera. Um, very interesting how that is quite a bit different. Exactly the same lighting. I've changed nothing. I've just swapped the laptop. I've just swapped the MacBooks over on the uh, desk here. And yeah, that's uh, pretty, pretty impressive how they've managed to do that. Finally, this is the MacBook Pro 13 inch M1 chip version here. And again, the image looks much better on here than it did on the original MacBook Pro, the Intel version. Um, looks pretty much the same as the Air, as I would imagine. Uh, the audio though, listen to the audio and tell me whether this is better because this apparently has the studio set up in here. So this should sound better than the other two. Again, let me know what you think and uh, I'll look at them back and I'll tell you what I think. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> I personally think, yes, there is a noticeable difference between the studio quality uh, mics and the standard, or it's not standard, but three mic array on the other two. And it's really good quality for a laptop, but it's obviously still not quite as good as an external pro microphone, in my opinion. And finally, on this section, speaker quality, which is pretty similar across the board. The Air and the Pros are capable of Dolby Atmos playback, but the Pros also have high dynamic range. In testing, there really isn't any difference between the M1 Air and Pro, but because I've got the 16-inch model on the Intel machine, the high-fidelity six-speaker system does sound slightly better. But the 13-inch Intel version doesn't have that set up anyway, and will sound pretty much identical to the other two new MacBooks. Very quickly, if you're enjoying this video so far, a sub would be awesome. So video image quality is one area that the new M1 chip helps the new MacBooks. But what about core performance? Video editing, for example. How hot do the machines run? How loud is the fan? So let's start with an export test of a video using the Final Cut Pro editing software, which is what I use for my videos. In this test, what I did is lay down three 4K clips over the top of each other on a 10 minute video, which is probably the average on the channel of what I would create. And then I clicked export. Now note on normal content, I would add transitions and text overlays, etc. But just for simplicity, I went for this. And as you can see, they all pretty much finished at the same sort of time. One thing to note is this Intel version here is pretty much spec'd out and the M1 versions are only base models. So if you were to spec out an M1 version, like I have done with the Intel version, I would imagine it would be slightly quicker than the Intel version, but there's not probably gonna be that much in it for exporting video. I have had the radiator on because it's freezing outside and now I'm boiling and my face is going to melt. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Now, one thing I have noticed when editing on all three of these machines is the M1 systems definitely run cooler than the Intel version and the fan noise is non-existent on the air because it has no fan, but also pretty much non-existent on the 13 inch Pro, the new one with the M1 chip, keep saying M1. Literally, I'm doing a lot of tasks and it's barely ramping up a sweat. And if you compare it to the tanker truck noise of the 16 inch MacBook that I've got, yeah, I've always thought my 16 inch MacBook Pro ran hot and loud. Sounds a bit X-rated, settle down. <laughs> it always seems to work really well, but it always seems to be working really hard in order to achieve that. Whereas due to the optimization of Apple's in-house chip, the new ones just seem to glide. And with numbers like 2.8 times faster CPU and five times faster GPU performance, there is no wonder. Apple's Bionic chips in their iPhones have always been right at the bleeding edge and have beaten off strong competition from Android phone manufacturers over the last five years or more in terms of benchmarks and raw performance. And it's about time Apple have made an in-house chip for their Macs to try and raise the bar in this really competitive area of the tech market. And I definitely feel with this, they've done that. 
Now the processor, GPU, RAM, for example, are all on the one chip, which brings a negative or two, which we'll get to, but also many, many advantages. The M1 MacBooks can engage their four high efficiency cores when you're doing simple things like emails or browsing the web. And if you're doing something more strenuous like video editing, it activates the four high performance cores. As a result, in theory, the new machines can conserve a ton of battery. And in my testing, that's definitely been the case. For everyday tasks, the M1 MacBooks last nearly twice as long in most cases, which is absolutely crazy. Apple claim 20 and 18 hours respectively for the 13 Pro and the Air for video watching. Video watching? What is that? You know what I mean. And web browsing and sort of fairly minimal tasks. And while I haven't quite got that much, it's certainly up there. And it's certainly better than the problems I've had with the Intel versions of the MacBooks over the last couple of years. Obviously, if I'm doing something more strenuous like photo and video editing, then it's not going to get anywhere near that. Um, but yeah, still pretty impressive. Another advantage of the new chip is the software compatibility of iPhone and iPad apps running on your MacBook if this is something you want to do. Although some people are reporting app compatibility issues with the new Apple Silicon. So this is something I would like to monitor and see how it progresses in the future. And that's not the only potential disadvantage of the new MacBook internals. Another would be the fact that they max out at 16 gigabytes of unified RAM, more than enough RAM for most people, although some would, I'm sure, prefer more. And whatever you buy now, you're stuck with. You can't upgrade the RAM on the new machines because the RAM is built in to the chip. It's unified. And that's a big problem for a lot of hardcore tech computer enthusiasts, I'm sure. To cut a long story short, if right now you think you need more than 16 gigabytes of RAM or you think you might need to in the future, you want to future proof that aspect of it, then you might want to go with an Intel version because you can get more and you can do more with it. So the new MacBooks are not perfect and there are many things that are very, very similar to previous generations. Would I have liked a new display? Yes. Would I have liked a better quality webcam? Yes. Would I have liked more ports? Yes. But this one single main change of the new chip is such a huge step and it's hugely exciting. Not just for these two MacBooks here, but for where Apple can take their Macs next. It's completely changed the game and it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the competition actually deals with this and actually tries to compete. In the M1 versus Intel debate, unless you want an external GPU or there are certain apps that you use, for example, that aren't yet compatible with the Apple Silicon, or the Mac 16 gigabytes of unified memory are going to be a problem, then I would definitely recommend the M1 version over the Intel version, not only for the obvious performance and battery improvements, but also for future proofing. But should you get the Pro or the cheaper Air if you are going for a new MacBook? Well, the truth of the matter is the fact that the Air has got much more powerful now with the same chip, it makes the decision far harder. The Pro is the better tech spec device, but it's heavier and less portable and it's more expensive. And in terms of everyday performance for most people, you're not really going to notice much of a difference. If you want your MacBook for emails, browsing the internet and like to travel a lot when, of course, we can uh, get, get the Air, in my opinion, no doubt. But if you want the best of the best and are not really fussed about the size of the display, then don't get any of them. And I mean that because I would personally wait for the new year when we will no doubt be getting a new MacBook Pro 16 inch with the new M1 chip. And that is going to be a beast. And I, for one, am incredibly excited to go and test it out. And I will, of course, be sharing my impressions and review with you when it drops I've just inv just told you it's going to happen and I have no idea whether it will or not. They'll do it. Trust. Have trust. Have faith. I've also got my review on the brand new Mac Mini M1 coming very, very soon. So if you want to see that, make sure you are subbed to the channel. Now, if you are looking at a new laptop to possibly work from home, manage your finances, or simply just to do a little more online shopping, then today's video sponsor, Zen, can help. Zen have partnered with MasterCard to launch a brand new digital financial service, and they can help you make payments safely and conveniently both online via the website or Android and iOS apps, or in-store with a contactless card. Some of the core advantages of Zen include 
12 months of extended warranty. So if anything goes wrong with your purchase, like if you were to buy a new laptop and it turned up broken or fake, Zen would cover the problem. They would cover the cost. They would give you a refund with their refund now policy. And they would then go and do the hard work and contact the seller and sort it out their end. You would have to do nothing. There's also 0% commission and you can receive cash back when using your Zen card. Zen is also great for people running an online business like a, an online store as you can connect Zen to your store and people can use it as a way to transfer money to you. You will get the best rates and instant access to your money as well and you can send and receive funds anywhere anytime with instant transfers between Zen users. On top of that you can actually save money thanks to conversions based on interbank exchange rates. And of course all the other already mentioned advantages of Zen for regular users also apply to business users as well. You can connect your Zen card to Android and Apple Pay, which is really handy. And since the account is internet national, so global, you can travel to any country and withdraw cash from an ATM machine with no additional markups for using different currencies. For more information, I will leave a link in the video description below so you can go through and check it out if you so wish. Like and share if you enjoyed the video and found it helpful and have a check out of some of the other videos that I'll leave listed here, some of the popular ones that you may be a fan of if you're new to the channel. I love you, Nevi. I'll see you in the next one. Take care, peace out.